spoke to you a few weeks ago about taking up our cross. And that sermon is on our YouTube channel. Today I want to bring you part two. So where I finished last, last time, I just want to move on at the start of this Holy Week. I've called today simply the wrong cross. Let me take you back to where I left you just a few weeks ago. In the clearing, in the forest, just outside Lawrence in Massachusetts, September 1976. I left the others in Uncle Joe's cabin, walked into the woods and came to that clearing, and that was where I chose to take up my cross. I'd literally fought and I'd argued with God ever since January of that year, and now it was September, it was nine months later, but in that forest clearing just outside Lawrence, I surrendered. And I simply said, I choose to trust you, Lord. And I went back into the cabin and I told Judith what I'd done and she was wonderful. Always has been and she still is. And then I told my pastor, George Jeffries Williamson, who was with us. And he said to me in his Irish accent, John, that's great. Now forget it. You know, I was, uh, I was a bit stunned. Excuse me, I thought. It's taken me nine months of agonizing and struggling to get to this point. What do you mean, forget it? But I said nothing. So let me just park my story there. I'll come back to that later. John 12, verse 12, we had it this morning. It says in, in my Bible, Jesus comes to Jerusalem as king. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meeting, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. See your king is coming, seated on the donkey's colt. So recapping from the other week, Jesus said, Take up your cross. You, me, take up your cross. It's a choice. It's voluntary. It's not forced on you by life or by other people. Your cross is your calling in Christ. It's your vocation, it's your ministry, it's your obedience to what he asks you to do. Your cross is giving up your own way. It's surrendering your will to God's will. His will, not yours. Jesus chose the cross. And so do we. I need to tell you today, it's quite possible to take up the wrong cross. You see, on that first Palm Sunday, Jesus was being offered an alternative way, the wrong cross. The crowds were shouting, blessed be the king of Israel. The prophet had written, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Jerusalem was rammed with people. It was heaving huge crowds. And his entrance was up through the eastern gate. And that was a triumph. You see, it had been prophesied that their king would come through the eastern gate. Judas and I have stood there by the eastern gate. The gate is no longer open. It was bricked up. You can't get through the eastern gate. It was bricked up in 1541. F yes, 1541 by the Ottomans. Because they'd heard the Jews said, our king is coming through the eastern gate. And so they blocked it up. They were 1500 years too late. The crowds were sure that he would be a national leader. He'd restore the nation to its former glory. This was going to be a very different vocation for Jesus. This was a different kind of calling, a different kind of kingship, a different kind of kingdom. The mob would have needed very little encouragement on that day to make him king. It had happened before. After he fed the 5,000, John 6, 14, after the people saw the signs that Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who was to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to make him king by force, withdrew to a mountain by himself. But kingship would have been the wrong way to go. It would have been the wrong cross that he took up, the Good Friday cross was the right cross. So he turned his back on the cheering crowd and he slipped back into Bethany to wait the right time, the right plan, the right cross. 
I want to teach you two lessons this morning, if I may, and they are linked. First of all, I want to teach you about the will of God. As a youngster, we were taught that it was absolutely crucial that individually we found the will of God for our lives. I wholeheartedly agree with that. Matthew 16, 14, Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. Giving up your own way is the flip side to finding the will of God for your life. It's only as we give up our own way, take up our cross, that we then discover the will of God. Very rarely does God come to any of us and say, this is what I want you to do. Are you prepared to do this? Usually, usually the sequence is first. He asks us individually if we are willing to accept his will. Go anywhere, do anything, give up our own way, give up our own very finely crafted plans. For me, that process, I've told you, took nine months of arguing and trying to negotiate with the Lord. And when I said, yes, Lord, I was accepting the will of God for my life. That was the general will of God. I had no idea what it would entail. How it would be worked out, where it would be worked out. One of my conditions then was, Lord, please don't ask me to be a pastor. But I... I had accepted the will of God for my life, and so it could be anything, and I didn't know what it would be. That was the general will of God. But then, when the time is right, the Lord Jesus then shows us the next step. And there's usually a time delay between us saying yes and then receiving his specific instructions. And so when I told my pastor, and he said, that's great, John, now forget it. Why? Because having given up my own way, we pause, we rest, we wait, we relax. We don't go barging around trying to make things happen, pushing doors, striving, stressing, and neither do we allow other people to load things onto us, telling us what we should be doing. I remember as a youngster, taking up your cross, meant you had to do something that you absolutely hated. If you're great with kids, then you should work with geriatrics. If you're shy and good at admin, then you should be doing an upfront role. If you're great at making cakes, you should be cleaning the toilets. You know, it was taken up by a cross. It was suffering. It was hating what you were told to do. Can I just say, that's rubbish. That is rubbish. That is not God's way. Instead, we wait. You wait. Because after we have uh, accepted God's general will for our lives, we wait his specific will. And there's no rush. We wait the where and the what and the when. It was FA Cup final day, 1977. Nine months after the, the forest clearing surrender. And I was settling down in front of the TV to watch the Cup final. And Judith was taking Mark for a walk. At that time, he was four. And the phone rang. And it was my fellow deacon from Eve Lane Church, a guy called Roger Meredith. Johnny said, we promised Pastor Williamson that we would go to the AOG district meeting today. They invited pastors to bring their elders and their deacons. What? Rog, it's cup final. I mean, what sort of leaders arrange meetings? When is the cup final? I says, nah. nah. Uh, Roger is very persistent. He says, John, we promised. So very, very reluctantly, very reluctantly. I went with Roger to a church in Cradley Heath. Can I just say, it was incredibly boring. It was before mobile phones, so I couldn't keep track of the FA Cup scores. I fidgeted a lot. I do tend to fidget. I? I did a lot of fidgeting and moving. I suppose I was being disrespectful. 
really, to those really good men and women. But we got to the end. They're about to close in prayer. And then Pastor Williamson, my pastor, who's leading the meeting, turned to a special guest, national guest that we had. And he says, oh, by the way, just to tell you that we're planning to plant a new church in Warsaw. I struggled to put this into words. But it was just as if time stopped. Freeze framed. And everything was slow motion. And I could, I could hardly breathe. And God said, that's where you're going. It was a holy moment. It was a life-changing moment for me and my family. As I walked out of the church, I said to Raj, God just told me where he wants me to go. It was confirmed the next day as I left Eve Lane's Sunday morning service. The general will of God had become the specific will of God. The where and the when. The how would take some time to get sorted. So lesson number one. It's essential to find the will of God for your life for this season. Because you need to know the seasons change and the will of God for your life changes. What the will of God was 40 years ago may not be the will of God now. Might be, but it may not be. If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. Giving up your own way and finding the will of God for our lives is its usually a two-step process. First, we submit to the general will of God. Yes, Lord, whatever, whenever, however. And having given up our own way, we pause and we rest and we chill and we relax. And in his time, we move into the specific will of God. And he tells us the where and the what and the how and the when. And that changes with the seasons of life. But whatever he asks you to do, he'll give you the way with all to do. You need to do that. Because some of you think, but how would I do it? If God is God, and he is, whatever he asks you to do, he will make you more than able to do that. Lesson number one, finding and accepting the will of God for our lives. Lesson number two. This second lesson I want to teach is all about not choosing the wrong cross. This is how you know you've taken up the right cross. It's the litmus test for confirming that we are in the will of God. Many years ago, a friend of Steve Chalk did a survey. It was across a wide range of churches of different denominations. And all of these different churches were experiencing uh, growth, periods of exceptional growth and blessing on these churches. And so this guy traveled all over the UK, visiting services, interviewing leaders. And his task was to identify the common threads across all these churches that accounted for their growth. Why were they growing when other churches were dying? What was the secret? After a year, he found nothing. Nothing. Wasn't the style of worship, wasn't the preaching, wasn't the outreach, wasn't the place they met in or the time they met. They had nothing in common whatsoever except one thing. And you'll probably think this is strange. The only common denominator across all of those growing churches was that each of them was a place, was a community where people laughed together. Some of you need to learn that lesson. Each church provided an environment in which people were relaxed enough to be able to laugh. In Huddersfield, there's a thriving church. A few years ago, they built a 2,500-seater conference center. And I read an article by their senior pastor. And when asked how they accounted for their remarkable success, he said that his leadership team laughed a lot together. Over the years, I've cried a lot. Got anxious about difficult situations. I've wanted to throttle certain people. Nobody at Kingsway, you understand that. Nobody. But you know what? I've done a lot of laughing. 
done a lot of laughing. Some years ago, the pastor of Bedworth Church, Glenn Barker, had a severe brain hemorrhage while he was preaching one Sunday. And Glenn was in his 40s. As he's preaching, he has this hemorrhage. Two days later, he died without recovering. I was desperately sad when I heard the news. Glenn was, was a great guy. But his last words to his wife as he lay dying on the platform was this. Don't forget the offering. <laughs> it reminded me of all the texts I sent to Deb from the QE last year. You see, there are times in life when all we can do is cry out to the Lord, and many of us have been there, but we need to learn to laugh. Church, we need to learn to laugh. Proverbs seventeen twenty two says, A cheerful heart is good medicine. Keep taking the medication, but a cheerful heart is good medicine. Luke ten twenty one says, At that time, Jesus was full of joy through the Holy Spirit. Yes, he was the man of sorrows, but not all of the time. He was a man of joy. The Lord Jesus asked us to take up two things. Number one, our cross. And number two, his yoke. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me, all you are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We take up our cross and his yoke. And this is the test, church. This is the test of whether or not we have taken up the wrong cross or somebody else's cross or a cross that has been placed on us by others or whether we have taken up the right cross. The cross that Jesus planned for us. The cross and the yoke are two word pictures. They're virtually saying exactly the same thing. But we take both of them. But the picture of the yoke gives us more details of what it's like to take up our cross. The context of these verses in Matthew 11 is rest. In my Bible, the heading is rest for the weary. Now, in the previous verses, Jesus denounced the cities where most of his miracles are taking place. Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida, and you, Capernaum, because they hadn't repented. They'd seen the miracles, they'd listened to Jesus, but they hadn't repented. No change whatsoever. Listen, you need to understand, miracles aren't always the answer. Shock, silence. Miracles aren't always the answer. Actually, miracles don't build churches. Miracles don't build churches. They may draw crowds but not necessarily make Jesus followers. They happened to Jesus in Chorazin and Bethsaida and Capernaum. Phil Yancey, in his book, The Jesus I Never Knew, writes this. The feeding of the 5,000 illustrates why Jesus, with all his supernatural powers at his command, showed such ambivalence towards miracles. They attracted crowds and applause, yes, but rarely encourage repentance and long-term faith. He was bringing a hard message of obedience and sacrifice, not a sideshow for gawkers and sensation seekers. Fill the answer. Miracles are not always the answer. Jesus knew that, and so he rebukes Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum for their lack of faith. And then his tone changes completely, and he says, come to me, come to me. All you are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. So, Lord Jesus, how do we find rest in a crazy world? How do we find rest? He says, take my yoke upon you. We really do have to double down when we're listening to Jesus' teaching. How does rest and yoke fit together? Because a yoke speaks of work. It fastened two oxen together to either plow or to pull a wagon. The yoke speaks of work. But Jesus is saying, if you want rest for your souls, if you want to be at peace, you need to work for Jesus. Sounds like an oxymoron, doesn't it? You want to get rest? Work. That's 
what Jesus is saying. The Greek word for rest here is anapoo. It's a verb. It means an intermission from labor. It means a time of refreshing. It means take it easy. Work and rest. Taking it easy after working hard. Work, then take a break. It's Jesus' work-life balance. Let me be a little provocative here. Some Christians are all about miracles and the supernatural and signs and wonders and speaking faith. I love that stuff. I've seen that stuff. I've been involved in that stuff. But Jesus has just laid into these local cities of Chorazin and Bethsaida and Capernaum. Why? Because and though he was the son of God, he did miracles. They still didn't repent. They didn't change their ways. They carried on doing their own thing, not his will. There's more to serving Jesus than miracle. Jesus did miracles, but he also worked. Jesus did miracles, but he also worked worked john 9 verse 4 he says i must work the work of him who sent me what it is day the night is coming when no one can work you see church our ministry our calling our vocation whatever you want to call it the will of god for our lives our cross is called the work of god the old hymn says there's a work for Jesus, ready at your hand. Tis a task the master just for you has planned. The yoke we are to take speaks of work. But then Jesus tells us more about it. He says, take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy. Easy. There were many rabbis. There were lots of teachers in Jesus' day, and they loaded their followers their disciples, they loaded them down with rules and regulations and laws and, and modes of behavior and what they could do and what they shouldn't be doing. And, and it was said that their yoke was heavy. Jesus said, my yoke is easy. This is how you know whether or not you've taken the wrong cross, the wrong yoke, because his yoke, his work is easy. And easy here means it's good, means it's gracious, means it's kind. The work of God is not intended to crush you, to drag you down, to depress you. Jesus' yoke is easy and it's gracious and it's kind and it's good. So if it's crushing you, it's not his yoke. It's not his yoke. You've taken up the wrong cross. Or it's one that somebody else has put upon you. Or it's one that you've put on yourself. You see, the yoke fastened two oxen together. And Jesus' yoke fastens me to the Holy Spirit. Fastens you to the Holy Spirit. And I walk along, sorry, I work alongside him to do the work. And he's the senior partner in this pair. In this partnership. He's the senior partner, not me. If I'm exhausted, if I'm shattered, if I'm depressed, and we've all been there, it's because I'm taking the lead and taking the strain instead of uh, allowing the Holy Spirit to do that. And Pastor Paul talks about the Holy Spirit last week wonderfully. He's the senior partner. But although his yoke is easy, these are also a burden. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus talks about the yoke and the burden. You will never effectively do the work of God without a burden. We need a burden for the work of God, whatever the task may be. A sense of responsibility, an awareness that this is my task. Whatever anybody else does, this is my task. This is my cross. I've chosen to take up my cross for Jesus and whatever anyone else does this is mine but his burden is light doesn't chafe or irritate doesn't weigh me down and it shouldn't because he said his burden is light a heavy burden is it's carrying stuff that he never told me to carry it's 
carrying stuff that other people should be carrying. But they're not carrying, so you've taken it on yourself and you shouldn't have done, because it's not his yoke for you. It's carrying stuff that's not my responsibility. It all gets too much. You see, we all have personal responsibilities and loads to carry. Yes. But Jesus here is talking about the work of God, our vocation, our task for him. And we are called to take up our cross, to take up his yoke. And the test of whether they truly are his is whether we are at rest. <coughs> his yoke is easy. It's gracious. It's good. It's kind. And his burden, and there is a burden, it's light. It's manageable. It's bearable. Let me close with a story. In the early days of the church at Junction 10, a man started coming to church and he came on his own. He turned out that his wife had agoraphobia, fear of open spaces. And she was afraid to leave her own home. And the church services were just too crowded, so she couldn't or she wouldn't come with him. Pastor John, he said, if you could put something on in the week, then she could bring some of her friends who also suffer from agoraphobia. Just a small group. Would you please? Please. And he asked me the next week, would you please? And you sensible people, and most of you are sensible, are thinking, who on earth will put a service on for agoraphobics? For people who are afraid to leave their own home. Well, the answer is this deaf pastor. So I hired and I paid the cost of a minibus every month. And I drove it around to pick them up. And I did the service and I drove them home. And all the time I was doing a full-time job and I got a young family and I was running the church. It was a nightmare. It was a nightmare. Those poor people couldn't even make it from the door to the minibus. And when some of them made it to the minibus, they then ran back in fear to the door. Out of a possible ten, a dozen people, if we actually got one or two into church, it was a miracle. And I did it month after month after month after month. It was utterly exhausting and frustrating and draining. But I refused to give up because I'm committed or stupid. You choose. Wasn't his cross. Wasn't his yoke. I choose to allow a very well-meaning man to put it on me. Listen, serving Jesus is the most satisfying work that you will ever do. You need to understand that. Does it involve work? Oh, yeah, it does. Lots of work. Would it involve a burden, responsibility, commitment, sacrifice of my own plans? Yes, would it involve laughter, enjoyment, fun, satisfaction? Yes, lots of that stuff. Will I be permanently exhausted, shattered, worn out, frustrated? Only if it's the wrong cross. There'll be difficult times. There'll be exhausting, confusing times, but they won't be permanent. And when I take up his yoke, hallelujah, I'm close to Jesus. I'm in tandem with the Holy Spirit. And I just allow him to take the lead. Bless God. And I allow him to take the strain. And I allow him to set the pace. And I allow him to choose the direction. And it's easy. Because he's good. And he's gracious. And he's kind. And so the Lord Jesus says to you this morning, at the start of Holy Week, Will you take up your cross and follow me? Will you? Let's just pray. It took me nine months of arguing, negotiating, trying to tell God what he should be doing. So I'm not expecting an immediate response. But I'd love for you to make a start. Maybe today 
in this service to choose to take up your cross to put down your own will and just step out in faith on this amazing God your step this morning simply is Lord I trust you I trust you and then you begin the process of giving up your own will and that's different for every one of you because we're all in diff different seasons of life for some of you this means you need to put down a cross you've carried for a long time because that season's over for some of you it's taking up a new cross well for some of you it means taking up a cross that you've put down too soon take up your cross take his yoke be yoked to the Holy Spirit in tandem with him I pray father in the name of Jesus that you would do a work through your word and by the power of your Holy Spirit and the lives of this congregation this morning. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would kill fear. I pray, Lord Jesus, you would drive away confusion and frustration. I pray in the name of Jesus, as these great people begin to choose to put down their will and to accept your will, that, Lord, the surprise of what that will be for many of them, I pray, Lord, you'll help them to cope with that. And to relax and to trust you because you are an amazing God. And you only ever intend good for us. And you can make a far better job of our lives than we could ever make, no matter how clearly we think it out. And so, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that all across this congregation, people would be taken up their cross, taken up your yoke as they begin to do the task that you call them to do. We ask it in the name of Jesus.